need a textbook today. Email me the number. Okay. I want to. Let's do You guys will need a blank piece of paper here in a bit if you want to go ahead and get that out. Second, thirty-second uh, preview of what your next unit will be is we will do section one point nine, which we are going to talk about today on inverse functions. And we did talk about inverse functions a little bit last semester, but we did that with trigonometric trig stuff. Uh, and honestly, that's a lot harder than just doing it with algebra. So this is um, considerably easier, at least for most people. But we're going to do section 1.9, then we're going to jump ahead to section 3.1, and we will spend a couple classes on exponential functions. And then we will go to section 3.2, where we do logarithm graphs and properties. 
So, one thing that should cross your mind is why are we going from section 1.9 to 3132? And the reason is logarithms can be difficult for some people, but logarithms are really the inverses of exponentials. So, if we review real well in section 1.9 what it means to be an inverse function, and then we learn what it means how to work with exponential functions, then we automatically know a little bit about logarithms because they're just the inverse of that. <coughs> so before I get going here on 85, I will spend five seconds talking about how we used this last semester just because I think that might give you some input on what we're doing today. So uh, last semester we did stuff like this where if it was a regular trig function the input was an angle and the output was a ratio and then when we did inverse functions inverse just means you swap the input with the output although technically those only exist in radians so same thing in algebra but what makes it easier in algebra is you don't have to memorize the range of the inverse trig functions like we did last semester uh, but it's basically the same idea. You're just swi swapping input with output. So when you did inverse functions in Algebra 2, you probably had a teacher that just said swap x and y and then solve for y. But what you were really doing is you were swapping the input, it just happened to be x, with the output, which happens to be y. So when we're talking about algebra, x and y's, you can just switch x and y and then solve for your new y. So one quick example that we will use on the, most of the rest of these notes, if I gave you this function and asked you to find his inverse, you would swap x and y like so, and then solve for the new y by undoing a plus one with the minus one and undoing a times two with the divide by two. The only other thing we really should add to this to make this mathematically correct is we need to change some of the notation a little bit here. We know f of x is really the same thing as y, so y can't be equal to 2x plus 1 and be equal to x minus 1 over 2. Two different things, so we shouldn't use the same variable. So instead of saying y, we should use the notation for inverse, which is if it's the inverse of f, it's like f, and it looks like it has a little negative 1 exponent. It's not really a negative 1 exponent, but that's what the notation looks like. So again, we don't want y to say two different things, so that's why we would do that. But again, algebraically pretty simple. Switch x and y, and solve for y. Now, if you want to prove or show that they're inverses, this is not the method to do this. I don't know why students like to lean on this method, but you can't just find this guy's inverse, say it's this, and then find this guy's inverse and say it's that. To prove or to show that they're inverses of each other, you have to do f of g and g of f. And what that means is, sometimes we write it with this notation, this little open circle here, which means composite. But what that really means is, this one I'm plugging g into f, and this one I'm plugging f into g. So we plug them into each other and if they're really inverses of each other both of them will simplify to be x. So same two functions from that I just found a minute ago. I started off with this function. I figured out that this was an inverse but if you were asked to prove or verify or show that they're inverses of each other, you would need to show this guy being plugged into this guy and that if you simplified it, it simplifies to x and you have to show the other direction as well. If I plug 2x plus 1 into x minus 1 over 2, the 2x plus 1 goes in everywhere there's an x. 
and then simplify. Plus one minus one cancels out, times two divided by two cancels out. So you just plug them in into each other, both directions, and simplify, show that it simplifies to x. That is a characteristic That's a characteristic of being inverse functions. Uh, do you remember doing this in Algebra 2? I see a couple of yeses. Anyone not remember? Okay. All right, so this is the only way to 100% foolproof, know that they're really inverses of each other, is by doing this process. But if you only care about being 99% correct, you can also think about them graphically. So even though mathematics, you know, we don't want to work with 99% correct, but this would be good for like the ACT where they're not trying to trick you or anything. If you wanted to know if two functions were inverses of each other quickly, you could graph both of them, especially if you had a calculator like the ACT. And if they're inverses of each other, they will have a line of symmetry at the line y equals x. So just hypothetically, the ACT might say, which one of these functions is inverse to such and such? Well, you could graph such and such, graph choice A, and if there's a line of symmetry at y equals x, if it looks like there's a line of symmetry, then you could just pick that and move on quicker. And if it wasn't, you could try choice B and see if it had it, or try choice C and see if it had it, just do process of elimination. But I want us for our notes to have it <coughs> uh, written down here so that we can visualize this a little bit better. So make a graph and try to make this as accurate as possible so that you can see what you need to get out of this. But let's graph F, which is 2x plus 1. So that would be a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of 2. You only need two points to define a line. This is f. Okay, for his inverse, bless you, you might want to split apart that fraction so that you can easily see the slope and the y-intercept. It's like the y-intercept is negative a half and the slope is one half. Again, the more accurate you do that, the easier this is going to be to see. So if you cared to know whether they're inverses just graphically, you could graph both equations like I did here. And especially if you have your calculator, just go ahead and graph this line too. The line y equals x is this one, where all the x and y values are the same. And if this is a line of symmetry, if it's cutting your overall graph in half, or, or and, you could flip the function over that line and land on the inverse, and you could take the inverse and flip it over that line and land on the function, then you would know those are inverses. The reason why I say this is only 99% effective is because it could look like this, but one of them could just be a tiny bit off. And you know, just scanning it with your eyes, you know, you're not going to notice if it's exactly, exactly perfect. So the only way to know for sure is algebraically, but graphically is fine a lot of times too. I'll come back to this in just a second because there's something else I want you to get out of that graph. Okay, some other terms we're going to throw around is we need to use the vertical line test sometimes. Vertical line test tells you if the relation is a function. So if you can draw any vertical line and it hits your graph once or less, it's a function. If it hits your graph more than once, it's not a function. And then horizontal line test um, this would tell you if your function has an inverse function.
Now we need to squeeze one little term in here because we will throw this term at you and I think it's one of the vocab terms, one of the, your first six book questions is one to one. Also one to one, as far as I know, is still asked a lot on the ACT so it's good for you to know this term. But to be one to one just means that it passes both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. Okay, and then I think the last reminder, or last thing I really want to point out to you before you can already start to practice this and be comfortable with most of it, is you need to make sure you understand the points and how a points on a function relate to a points on the inverse. So let's just make up a couple quick points for a quick example. Let's say the function goes through 0, 1, 2, 7, and I don't know, 11, 5. All it means to be an inverse is that you're swapping the input and the output. So 0, 1 becomes 1, 0, 2, 7 becomes 7, 2, 11, 5 becomes 5, 11. You're just switching x and y. Just like if you were trying to find an inverse function, your first step is to switch x and y. That's all you're doing. Now, I want to go back to that graph because it's a visual of what this is saying. Notice on this graph, this function had a point at 0, 1, which guaranteed that his inverse had a point at 1, 0. That's how it's reflecting over this line y equals x. Here's another point, 1, 3, which means this has to have a point 3, 1. And of course, you could copy as many points as you know about the function, switch x and y, and plot points about the inverse. Or you could take points on the inverse, switch x and y, and plot them to get points on the function. So the more you know about a function, the more you know about its inverse, which again, as we move on the next couple weeks, we will, after this, we'll do exponential functions and then logarithmic functions, for, which are really just the inverse of exponential functions. All right, so the book assignment is pretty short here, and I'll be honest, most years, this is typically just a one-day unit where you practice it and we would quiz on this next class. Um, I was not in charge of the planning for this unit, so I'm not really sure why Miss Thomas squeezed in an extra day. But you guys have this class period to practice that pretty short book assignment, because the first six are just vocab. And then next class I will have a practice quiz for you, and then you should have some time to look over your notes and stuff. So that should make for a pretty easy week for you guys. but. I need you to do these questions to make sure you don't need help on anything. Um, I do not have every one of these worked out on my website like I do for a lot of the sections. I have all of the questions that my first period class asked today, which was like four or five of them on there. Um, but you should have plenty of time to finish that up and get it turned in. So. I will give you guys a little bit of a head start and then I'll come around to see how it's going and if I see any common um, errors or common hiccups from everybody, I'll talk about it on the board.
Um, also, I guess one other thing I should say, I, I probably should add this to the notes, but the most common mistake about inverse functions is you guys sometimes mix them up with reciprocals. Remember, a reciprocal is when you flip the fraction over. That has nothing to do with inverse functions. I know it's like you're switching something, but reciprocals and inverses, make sure that you don't get those two confused. We're not doing anything with reciprocals. Switching input and output is not the same as switching numerator and denominator. And based on first period, I think everybody was able to finish that up easily in class and get it turned in. So please do the same thing. I guess if this is a weakness of yours and you need to wait till Friday to get it turned in, that's okay. But if I don't have it by the start of class Friday, it will be late.
All right, is there any of the six vocab that you're struggling to find? You don't need help with any of the vocab? Um, how about the vocab or question 10 or 15 or 18? Any of those you've tried? Do you want me to go over?
and the author again. Questions 1 through 6 or 10, 15, 18, 21, 29. Anything from the first half of this assignment that seems harder to you than the rest? Which one? How do you do 29? 29. So, Let's see, 29 wants us to do two things. It wants us to show that these two are inverses algebraically and graphically. So the only way to do it algebraically is to plug them into each other and show that they simplify to x. So this plugged into here would look like 1 over 1 over x. And then remember, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by his reciprocal. So that does come out to be the x that we were expecting. But you've got to show it the other direction as well, which is kind of silly in this question because it's the exact same thing. But dividing by 1 over x is the same as multiplying by x over 1. So that's what you would have to do for part A, showing that they are inverses algebraically. And then for part B, the graphic part, if you graph f of x, it's going to look like that. That's a lesser known parent function, but it was probably one you memorized at some point in algebra 2. And then if you graph g of x, it's the exact same function. So since these have a line of symmetry at y equals x, that's how we could say that they're inverses graphically. Graph them, graph y equals x, and show c that y equals x is a line of symmetry. So this is a pretty rare case where 1 over x is his own inverse. Most functions are not their own inverse, but 1 over x is. All right. Um, all right, you guys might be a little further than I thought. So anything maybe up to question 55 or 58 that I could help with? back in in a bit.
Um, but what I was going to say is, I know some scholarships, like there's some scholarships you can get automatically for certain ACT scores. Mm -hmm. So that could be where it's worth your time to actually study some.